without further ado, I'm going to introduce here um, Heather Klusaritz, who whom you heard the other day as one of the uh, uh, conference co-chairs, along with Rochelle Rene, a partner in crime conference co-chair, from both of whom are from Philadelphia. So Heather, Rochelle are going to introduce our speaker of the day. Thank you, Natalie. We're really excited, Heather and I, to uh, really about this presentation and what a fitting topic. Uh, our American dilemma, placing an equity lens in the struggle for diversity and inclusion. You know, given the current landscape and what COVID-19 has unmasked over the last eight to nine months uh, in regards to structural racism, uh, in regards to health disparities, the impact on Black, Brown, Indigenous people of color, Dr. Ross, we believe uh, in this presentation offers such a unique blend of experiences and perspective uh, that will be transformative to how we really see each other in this country and really an appreciation to why diversity and inclusion and equity, health equity really matters. And so Heather will tell you a little bit about our featured speaker. Thank you, Rochelle. And yes, I, we share your excitement um, in introducing Dr. Will Ross and welcoming, welcoming him to our plenary session today. Dr. Ross is the Associate Dean for Diversity at the Washington University School of Medicine and Professor of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology. And um, he is really a leader in the space of um, diversity and cultural competence and um, increasing uh, the diversity in our healthcare workforce. He has had um, a storied career of recruiting and developing a diverse workforce while focusing on the promotion of health equity locally, nationally, and globally. He is the co-founder of the Barnes Jewish Hospital Center for Diversity and Cultural Competence and served on a task force that created the Washington University Institute for Public Health while serving as co-director of the new MDM-PH program there. He is the vice chair of the Washington University Commission on Diversity and Inclusion and has been instrumental in redesigning local access to health care for the underserved as the founder of the Saturday Neighborhood Health Clinic and co-founder of Casa de Salud Latino Health Center. His accolades go on and on, and we could not be more excited to have him here with us today to speak to us on this critical topic at this important time in our country. Dr. Ross, welcome. Thank, thank you, uh, Heather, uh, Rachel, uh, Rochelle, for that um, introduction. Thank you, Neftali, and the rest of the team for, for inviting me to this forum. Uh, and so let's get started. So uh, is my screen available there? I take that as a yes. Yes. yes great. We're good. great. Well, you know, I, I'm kind of a stage wanderer, and this is going to be a little hard for me to, to not wander <laughs> but sit in my, my, at my desk in the chair and, and talk to you. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to do this. Uh, uh, I'll use my hands a lot. I guess it'll help. And I do agree that this is a really an opportune time to have this discussion because we really are at a crossroads in this country. Uh, as we actually try to forge a path ahead that will allow us to do so without uh, creating such um, uh, a cleavage in, in, in the body politic that will be dysfunctional uh, as a unit, dysfunctional as a country. I'm an optimist uh, at hand. And prior to giving this discussion, I want to just make some disclaimers. I'm also a pragmatist. Uh, I'm one of those people who are, who are, who are a kind of a centrist, uh, which means that my uh, conservative friends think that I'm a liberal and my liberal friends think I'm conservative. Uh, uh, and I actually think that's kind of good because you know, I can play them off each other. Uh, and so I'm also someone who's really just couched in the civil rights movement uh, from the 1960s. Uh, and, and, and that really, you, you, that really is going to play in a lot of what I'm going to talk about as we discuss American, uh, our American dilemma, placing an equity lens on the struggle for diversity and inclusion. And so what I hope to accomplish in this, and I think we're going to go do this in about 45 minutes, because I want to have ample time to engage you, the audience, uh, with questions, and please uh, send them to me uh, uh, if, if you want to, even before I conclude. But I do want to 
dissect this issue of cultural diversity and inclusion. What does it really mean and how does it relate to, re to the resolution of disparities? There's a lot of misinformation about what cultural diversity means and, uh, and as a consequence, there's a lot of pushback because no one's really uh, sure of what the long-term objective is. So we need to talk about that. And, and uh, as usual, we have to have a really robust discussion about our unique social political history in this country about you know the you know the you know the, the long standing uh, inequities uh, that manifest itself in these uh, social determinants of health and these uh, remarkable uh, inequities we're going to talk about. Uh, I hope to provide some examples, some real world examples, some actionable examples that you can take back to your own institution. And then in the final analysis, I want all of you to walk out of here saying that you understand and you're willing to state emphatically that structural racism is a public health crisis and we cannot move forward, particularly this particular unit, until we declare that and we actually get in ourselves, get ourselves into an action-oriented uh, stage. Hi, Dr. Ross, sorry to interrupt. Could we um, put the presentation in the full presentation view? Oh, I thought it was. We're still seeing the slides on the set. Okay, is it not now? Not yet. Okay, let me. Second. Okay. Uh, I I thought it was. No worries. You may have multiple screens. Okay, let yeah. me go back and try something here. Uh, let me stop. Let me just go back and try this again. I do apologize. Oh, no worries. No worries. Sorry to interrupt. How's that? Still seeing the slides on the side. I would suggest just carrying forward. It, it's not the big deal. It gives you an option to resume slideshow. Go up to your top left, resume slideshow. Okay. So I may have to have you then uh, place resume this in. Right under where your font size. Oh, it disappeared. <laughs> I think the fundamental issue is actually multiple screens and Zoom is, is not showing the screen where the slides are being presented. So I would just suggest moving forward with the slides as is, Dr. Ross. Um, well, I, uh, okay. Uh, is there some way for you to actually present this from, yes. uh, from it, internally? Why don't you do that? And then you can sense. advance the slides accordingly. Yes. If you could just stop sharing, I'll share it from my end. Is everyone seeing that all right? Okay, great. Uh, so hopefully this is going to work. Thank you. So uh, uh, you'll have to advance. I'll have to have advanced slides. So next slide, please. So this is the book I'm reading currently, uh, and I, I think it really uh, sets the stage for this discussion. Uh, John Meacham's book, The Soul of America, really talks about uh, uh, you know, the time uh, in history when we uh, were at a similar impasse, whether it be the revolution, the Civil War, uh, or the Civil Rights Movement, and others, even the time of, uh, uh, prior to uh, the Reconstruction, uh, after Reconstruction, the, the uh, era of Grim, uh, Jim Crow, when we wondered whether or not we could really survive. And he takes the same stance that I do, that we really, at, at, when we're under distress, uh, when, when we're, under, when, when, when we're uh, wondering where is the next stage of, 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 of hope in our country, we're always able to fall back on each other and really uh, get some support from uh, the better souls, uh, the better angels uh, that are among us. Uh, and I love his quote. He states, in our finest hours, the soul of the country manifests itself in an inclination to open our arms rather than to clench our fists. Uh, we do this. We find the soul of America by, by really asking who we are and what we stand for. Uh, and definitely, that becomes a moral statement. What do we believe? Uh, what are our values? And I think it's important to reflect on this. What are our values and what are our morals as we wonder how we're going to get ourselves through the next iteration of this country's uh, uh, civil unrest? Next slide. 
Now, allow me to wax philosophically for just a minute here, if you, if you may. Uh, I think it's important that we actually have this philosophical uh, foundation to really get us a sense of how to mobilize the, our constituent groups into action. And so uh, when I actually think about moral foundations, uh, it takes me back to Reinhold Niebuhr, who we all consider one of the preeminent uh, theologians and philosophers of the 20th century and the intellectual uh, mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, so uh, in a classic thesis, uh, Moral Man and the Moral Society, uh, uh, Dr. Niebuhr uh, writes this, and I quote, the moral attitudes of dominant and privileged groups are characterized by universal self-deception self and hypocrisy. The reason why privileged classes are more hypo hypocritical than underprivileged ones is that special privilege can be defended in terms of the rational idea of equal justice only. Now, what does he mean by that? He's saying that uh, when we have a society uh, which is, uh, which, which is uh, two-tiered, uh, which is hierarchical, uh, there is a great belief in, e in, in, in equal justice. If someone uh, has been living on the fringes and, and, they're, and they're hungry, and you have 100 people who have been feeding well and they're not hungry by saying, you know what, I'm going to give everyone a slice of bread today. Therefore, we have created justice. Look at us. We've done well. Well, that does nothing for the fact that the person who has been hungry for, for, for months has muscle wasting and sarcopenia uh, and, and decrease visceral protein stores. This does nothing to address that. So what Dr. Nibur is stating is that we have to, we, we have to believe in equal, just, equal justice, but there's something higher that we have to strive for, and that really is equity. Now, he did not use this term in this thesis, but that really is, in essence, what he's saying, that equal justice has been a way of proving that we are contributing to the good of the whole, when in actuality, we may be preserving the status quo. We may need to move beyond that by promoting equity. Next slide, please. Now, this took another level when Swedish uh, sociologist, Agatha Merdal, decided to review this whole issue of, of justice in America. A and a very extensive um, um, report called An American Dilemma, thus the title of our topic today, An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in Modern Democracy. And in this, in, in this thesis, uh, Garner Myrtle asserts that in, in the United States, we've created these moral gradations. Uh, we've been able to justify how we've treated each other. Now, these, we've been able to justify the hierarchies by saying, well, we do good on, to, to, to an extent. Shouldn't we be um, committed on the good we do as opposed to look at what we've done that is actually denigrating and demoralizing? And he asked that we really reflect on these moral evaluations, particularly as it relates to the treatment of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, how we've justified the, you know, the, the maltreatment, justified you know, the, you know, the extermination of, of, uh, of, Nat of Native Americans uh, and justified uh, you know, the, the current uh, um, uh, 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 focus on uh, uh, pushing back against uh, immigrants in this country. Uh, so uh, we need to really reflect on these moral valuations uh, and, and, and ask how do we move to the next level. Uh, next slide. So again, neither uh, Gunnar Mer uh, Merdahl uh, nor uh, Ryan Hull and the Borough use the term health equity, but that is the preferred term. Uh, there are many, uh, on many occasions, I would give lots of discussions, and I was giving a talk in London year, years ago, and I was talking about health disparities. And someone interrupted me and said, oh, you Americans, you're always talking about what you, who has something, who doesn't have something. Well, you, that's not appropriate. You know, here in, in the enlightened, uh, enlightened Europe, we talk about health equity. Uh, and health equity, uh, you know, in, in their sense, really is, is what we're really promoting. Uh, that's a, that, that, that state where every individual in this country has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. There is no floor and there is no ceiling in health equity. Uh, as opposed to health disparities when we talk about the disproportionate burden of disease borne by a particular group, uh, even when you control for access to care. Uh, we use that term. But I don't want us to use those terms interchangeably anymore. They really are different. And from thus 
for uh, going for uh, going forward in this presentation, I'm going to really try my best to talk about health equity. Although I may reflect on the term disparities, uh, and I'll put it in the proper context. Are you with me so far? If you are, we'll move on. Next slide. Now, what happens when we don't achieve that enlightened state of health equity? Here's what happens to those who aren't able to fulfill their dreams. And this is from a classic uh, uh, array of poems by Langston Hughes. It's called Montage on a Dream Deferred. And this one particular piece is simply called generically a dream deferred. Let's listen to this poem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Next slide. Does it explode? Why is it that we have one group of individuals in this country who are, dis who are uh, divorced from reaching their full health potential, and as a consequence of this chronic stress, which re reaches a toxic level in the communities, they explode and they scream the pain of agony, of being alienated, of not having their dreams uh, fulfilled. Was it, what happens when we look at this, when we see this happening, and then we say, why are they doing this? What, why are they rioting? Why are they so angry? Does this sound familiar, people? I hope it does. What we need to understand is that there are these, indeed, these, these social and structural determinants of health that really dictate who has access to resources and who can reach their full health potential and who does not have access to their full to these resources to reach their health, full health potentials and and this construct which was actually uh, you know uh, embedded uh, fortunately in healthy people 2020 initiative uh, piece of, I, I really was pleased to work with with uh, centers for disease control you can see there really are five uh, constructs in our social determinants of health domains uh, health, health domain uh, five constructs First, and I don't want to go through all the, I'm not going to go through the detail, but you can see from the slide, you now the first piece is economic stability or lack thereof, followed by the levels of educational attainment and health literacy, the ability to act upon health information. Then there's this issue of the neighborhood and the built environment. Then the social uh, and community context, particular focus on social norms. We're going to really talk about that toward the latter part of this presentation. And lastly, health access. Uh, uh, health care access. These are the social and structural determinants that you as an audience, I'm sure, are quite familiar with. And we're going to take this information and really try to deconstruct some of the data uh, that, uh, that we see with regards to inequities in this country. Next slide. So now what does it have to do with diversity and inclusion? Uh, I, I, I hold two roles here at the medical school. Yes, I'm the associate dean for diversity and inclusion, but I'm also our principal officer for uh, community partnerships. Uh, and I don't think those, uh, those particular uh, titles should be separated. I, I see them as one and the same. Now, let me try to convince you of that. And I'm, I'm, I'm not always successful, but give me an opportunity to try to convince you of that. Now, we all believe in diversity, you know, having people of different backgrounds and different opinions in the same room, but when they're invited to dance, when they actually the voices are listened, when when their voices are active in societal institutional change, we call that inclusion. And so the, the preferable term really is inclusion. Uh, and so uh, so how can we then? Uh, and how can you? I mean, I'm, I'm I'm charging you. How can you develop an inclusive atmosphere, an inclusive institution that really leverages diversity to include environmental create an environment and a culture that is that is welcoming and productive? Next slide. So, so here's, here's the issue, and, and this is a particular uh, relevant issue right now, very contemporary, because we're going to have a, a review of this, uh, of a fact that review is ongoing right now uh, at, the US, at the Supreme Court, and it could certainly be ongoing uh, as the Supreme Court changes its, uh, its leanings uh, uh, in the next, uh, 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 well, we'll see what happens. So what happens to diversity, why, why, why is diversity under assault? And it is under assault in this country. Well, here's what we say when we justify diversity. Well, well, the U.S. population is more diverse. That's why we need to have diversity and inclusion. We want justice and access to careers. These are all agreeable. No one, no one, no one has any problem with this. Access to care for the underserved, of course. 
culture of appropriate care? Absolutely. A research agenda? Yes. Management healthcare systems? Yes. These things are all good, but I want you to recognize that all those things that are listed are necessary, um, um, but, but they're not, you know, they're not sufficient to really give uh, all uh, individuals an, an opportunity to reach their full health potential. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. We need to do more than just have diversity. Next slide. Here's what we need to do, and 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 here, this is really the sixty thousand dollar question. You know, what do we ask diversity to do? Now we've created a cottage industry on diversity and inclusion, and people do lots of discussions and lots of diversity workshops. I used to do that. I don't anymore because I'm, I'm I want to drive a little deeper and ask, what do we ask diversity to do? Well, there are three things. One, we want us to realize our values, our individual values, and our collective values, our values as a country. Two, we want diversity to address the most comp not just address but address and heal the most complex problems in our country. Three, we want to enhance our viability. You know, state. You know, this is this is the how good we are. This is this issue of, of, of inclusive excellence that you heard about, uh, that, that we talk about. This is this whole issue of, of a country that we become a better country as a consequence. These are, these are the questions that we should be asking when we talk about diversity. Next slide. So let's, let's dissect those. Let's talk about, now I'm, I'm gonna have you do the, this, this uh, individually. When you go home, I'm gonna tell you, you know, here, here's where I stand. Here are my values. My values are the products of the civil rights movement in Memphis, Tennessee. I grew up there in the 60s. Uh, and, and the images that you're seeing on your screen were not images that, that, were, that were historical. I saw these things happen with my own eyes in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was impactful to see these things and it changed how I think. Next slide. I grew up in a troubled time, in a troubled era on the wrong side of the tracks in, uh, in, 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 in uh, housing, uh, 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 subsidized housing. Uh, uh, there I am, I have my bow tie on with my two sisters there in, in Memphis in 1962. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, as Langston Hughes said in another poem, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Uh, so sure, I came up on a tough side, but that 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 led to me having a different sort of values and desire to act on those values. Thank you. I'm trying to rock that bow tie. Next slide. So here's what happened. Uh, I was 10 years old, a very you know uh, a very aware 10 years uh, old uh, when the sanitation strike uh, hit in Memphis uh, in 1968. This was downtown. On Main Street in Memphis, and, and and I was walking through with my friends, looking at what was happening, and we and, and we actually had hope, and we thought about this. Now, you know, things are going to change. Dr. King is coming to town. He's going to make life better. We were we were feeling good about it uh, about ourselves as as young black kids. We were feeling that things were going to finally get better for us. And the next slide. What happens to a dream deferred? This is Dr. King on the, uh, on the uh, floor and uh, on the balcony being shot after being shot by uh, James Earl Ray. Uh, they're pointing over to the warehouse when the police asked where did the shot uh, uh, come from and they said over there. Um, what happens to a dream deferred? Um, we, we, we were, it, it was more than just a gut punch uh, and, and we were angry and, and we exploded. Uh, and America exploded. And we all remember um, 1968. So as John Meacham said, we've been through this before, folks. We've had a divided country before. We've had agony and pain uh, before, as we did at that moment, April 4th, 1968. But you know what? We got through that. And we will get through this year also. Next slide. Let's fast forward uh, because I'm embracing all of this ethic of service. And, and, and you know, uh, years later, I became the uh, medical director of a public hospital, which had as its mission to provide high quality affordable care to the underserved. Unfortunately, that, that hospital closed under financial duress. And when I came back to Washington University, I felt that we had to move our institution a little bit further, that we couldn't just be talking about biomedicine and inclusive culture. Next slide. 
We have to talk about something more. We have to talk about a medical center without walls. And so as a, 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 my first approach was to create an initiative in our office where we expanded our mission to encompass community and population health. We had to link our diversity with the medical workforce of the medical workforce and, and really address this issue of promoting health equity. If we didn't, then we would be uh, having an existential crisis about who are we, why are we doing this? What is our purpose? Next slide. Mm -hmm. So I went further and I made this statement uh, uh, when I created this office in 1996 at Washington University. Improving cultural diversity within the academic workforce should not only be a 21st century moral imperative, but a centerpiece in our national effort to eliminate health equities, inequities rather, a centerpiece. And I use the term moral, moral imperative. And this is a term that I'm asking that we take uh, from this presentation, that we not be afraid to stand up and say, we have a moral imperative to state what is right for this country, to assert what is right for this country. Uh, we won't survive until we survive uh, until we make that statement. Uh, as, as John Meacham stated, we've been here before and we survived because we took that moral high ground. Next slide. I had an opportunity. Uh, I, I was feeling good when I wrote that statement. You know, I said, okay, this I'm ready to take this on the road. I'm going to talk to all these individuals, all these groups around the country. And I'm going to say, here's what we need to do. We need to move away from talking about minority affairs. Let's just, let's just shelve that. Let's talk about health equity and let's change our roles. And let's, let's not talk about just simply recruiting people and counting numbers and bodies in a building. That's all good and dandy, but what are we trying to do with those numbers? What are we asking diversity to do, right? We're asking diversity to address some of our main health issues. And so we have to move away from simply counting bodies and counting numbers. So I presented this, uh, this is the first meeting in, in, in New Mexico, and the next slide really was the response. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, uh, you know, the, I know, I, I know they, they were coming at me. Uh, and I was like, you know, the Frankenstein monster, oh my goodness, I, it's, it's like I said something bad about their mama. So I, I, I said, whoa, 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 wait. And so, I, you know, I, it, it was really tough because at the time they really were not responsive to it, taking this term because it meant that we would have to have the requisite resources to do something about it. And you do have to have the requisite resources to do something about it, but power can seize nothing without a challenge. You have to challenge authority in order to get the resources. And so I didn't back down, but they backed up. Next slide. I became a somewhat, uh, I, I, no, I, I was reaching out in other years, you know, a couple of people called me and said, Will, don't, don't back down. We believe in you. Stand strong. Uh, and they sent this email to me, but it was, it was, it was directed toward, uh, to the Associate Dean for Adversity. And I, and I said, well, well that, that really helps. Thank you. I mean, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I, you know, it was, I wonder if, if, if that was a slip or not. So we'll, we'll, I never found out whether, whether he really meant that. Next slide. You know, I was at a crossroads, and whenever I'm at a crossroads, I go to my favorite cynic, uh, Woody Allen. Uh, he didn't help me out with this, of course. He only made matters worse. And so uh, rule number one, when you're at a moral impasse, don't go to Woody Allen. Next slide. So I went back and I said, here's what we need to do. We need to start talking about the data and really presenting you know, a, a cogent reason for diversity and inclusion. Here's part of the cogent reason. You know, when you look at this slide, which is looking at the percentage of the, uh, of the uh, minorities in America uh, over time uh, with projections, you can see that you know, this, bo this bottom blue line shows the projected increase in minorities and that by 2044, the minority population will no longer be minority, will be a majority population, much as we're seeing in Texas and California and that we should have a diverse inclusion as a consequence, uh, particularly in the medical profession. Next slide. Next slide. And so, uh, and so within the medical schools, this was, this was really embraced. Diverse inclusion was embraced because if you look, again, look at the bottom panel of the solid line, this is actually showing medical school matriculants, you know, which had a steep increase over the 60s, uh, then approximated 8% with a slight increase in 1990, but basically kind of stabilizing at 10% and being unchanged. And so despite all that we've done, there's not been a demonstrable increase in minorities in medical schools in this country. Next slide. In fact, 
in 2014, there were fewer African-American males in medical school, matriculating in medical schools, than there were when I applied to medical school in 1980. Uh, next slide. And, and this is the most um, a painful slide to really talk about. This is actually looking at physician workforce. And on the, uh, the bottom slide, no, the, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the number of physicians. And uh, you may not be able to see this, but um, the, the, uh, the, the black men, black women, um, black, black men are in gray uh, uh, squares, uh, uh, tri uh, uh, boxes on a uh, tethering that, that, that bottom line. And you can see from 1980 to 2012, that number has not changed. You know, you know the, the number of physicians proportion to you know, um, uh, their, their, their peers hasn't changed. No change in all this time period. Next slide. Uh, and, and I don't want to, you know, I'm going to skip this slide because this is the next slide because I, I'm looking, I want to make sure we, we, we have time for questions. There, there was a lot in the last slide. I'll go over that you know, maybe a little later. So, so that's the first thing we're asking our, our diversity to do. We're asking diversity to, to address these complex issues, right, of, of actually providing a diverse workforce. But guess what? We haven't gotten there. And why? And I would say the same thing in, 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 in psychology and the same thing in law and the same thing in business. We haven't gotten there. Diversity hasn't worked. It doesn't mean that it can't. It just means that we have to do something more than simply present a statement. We have to actualize that statement. We have to operationalize that statement. Diversity and stating that isn't enough. What else do we ask diversity to do? To fulfill, to address uh, complex problems? Well, here's a complex problem. Speaking of the 60s, in 1965, uh, the Watts uh, riots uh, really uh, just convulsed the country. Uh, and in response to the Watts riots, uh, President Lyndon Johnson, uh, as a former Illinois uh, governor, um, Otto uh, Kerner, to do an evaluation review of what were the underlying uh, factors that, that drove the Watts riots. And, and many of you will remember the report. It was called the Kerner Commission Report, or the Kerner Report. And it is stated uh, uh, in, in the most uh, stark words, uh, we now have two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Well, that was in 1965. I dare say that I am inclined to agree with Christopher Mary's report, and this was a report that was uh, produced a few years back, when he went so further as a state that we actually have eight Americas, not two Americas, one black, one white, but eight Americas. Next slide, I'm gonna tell you what, how, what we mean by that. So if you see the slide, we have eight Americas stratified according to whether they're an Asian population, low income whites, middle Americas, uh, 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 poor Appalachian, uh, Mississippi Valley, Native Americans, black middle, black poor, rural South and black, black high risk urban. Uh, when you look at those different populations and you look at the life expectancy and these curves, you can see that they are, these life expectancies improve over time, but they never intersect. For the most part, that bottom panel, which is black high risk urban, has the lowest life expectancy in the country. And that has not, you know, the disparity has not improved. You know, there's been improvement in the life expectancy, but the disparity has not improved compared to, to the highest uh, life expectancy group in Asians. So this is what we mean by two, by eight different Americas. Uh, not fulfilling their uh, uh, their health their their highest uh, potential. Next slide. Ferguson happened in August 2014. Michael Brown, an 18 year old man, was walking down the street, an off street, by the way, in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, and he was approached and asked to move over. He said, "I'm just walking down the street," and then uh, about 20 minutes later, he was dead. We all know what happened. And, and, and speaking of convulsing of a society, we know what happened. Next slide. Well, I, I went to that community uh, the next day. Uh, I don't think it was the next day. It probably been a, it'll be, I'll, I'll probably a week later. I went to that community, and I was uh, I was in the church uh, in response. And uh, I uh, when I was when I was leaving, uh, a, a news reporter saw me and came over and asked me what did I think about what was going on. And I gave him maybe a little too long-winded of an answer. I said, Maca Brown died not because uh, he was, you know, um, uh, or rather Ferguson erupted, the protests erupted, not because Michael Brown died, but because of the context, the social, the social uh, framework that led 
to Michael Brown being considered a threat to society. And that framework was really contextualized by all these other factors, the increase in poverty in that community, in St. Louis or in other in, in, uh, industrialized cities, the increase in infant mortality, three, four, three, to, three to four times higher among African-Americans, the unemployment rate, this is from 2015, even now if uh, that unemployment rate is still three times higher among blacks compared to whites, educational attainment. And so I said, this is why Ferguson erupted. And he said, well, that's too much information. I don't want to use that. I walked out. I was happened to be reading, I happened to read the newspaper five years later as we're talking about, you know, the five year anniversary of Ferguson. And this is what I read. It said, it was the intersection of poverty, unemployment, lack of educational opportunity and deep rooted, deep rooted racial animosity where the confrontation developed that cost Michael Brown his life. And I said, my goodness, he got it. They finally understood it. I said, this is necessary in order to really recognize what we need to do in order to reach, get every individual to reach their full health potential. Next slide. And, and, and at the same time this came out, I happened to be reading a great book by Tana Hissi Coates called Between the World and Me. And I love this quote. I took this out uh, that same day uh, that that newspaper article came out. I took this quote. It said, one cannot at once claim to be superhuman and then plead moral error. I propose to take our countrymen's claim of American exceptionalism seriously, which is to say I propose subjecting our country to an exceptional moral standard. But, you know, so, so my kids uh, uh, tell me I'm finally waking up to use the word woke. I think I'm woke, but you know, like, you know, but Tanya Hesey is really woke. And so he really talked about this exceptional moral standard. This is what I'm trying to convey to you. We need to use that term. Next slide. And then this happened. Speaking of moral standards, the death of George Floyd. Next slide. Well, that, 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 that was, you know, the disgust was palpable among all of us in this country. Uh, and, and here we are, me with my colleagues at the Medical Center, uh, in response, we took a knee for eight minutes uh, to memorialize the death of, of George Floyd. And we held our hands up, declaring that racism is a public health crisis. We felt good about ourselves. But what's, what's going to happen a day later? How do you actualize this? How do you move this you know, forward where you actually can really begin to deconstruct uh, all of the damage that's been done in this country? Next slide. COVID is with us. And at the same time now, we have a crisis within a crisis. Because we, we sort of know that African Americans and the Latinx community are, dying, are, are contracting COVID at a rate of three times that of the white population and both groups, uh, and I should add in the, the Native American population also, all three groups, Native Americans, African Americans, uh, and Latinx population are dying at twice the rate of white Americans. And now we know why these issues are, in, are, uh, in, are, are, are linked. Um, and, and there's no way to, to really uncouple one crisis from another because they have the same upstream determinants. Next slide. Let me give you, let me show you uh, what's going on when I talk about those upstream determinants. This is a map of the St. Louis Metropolitan Statistical Era, er, er, uh, 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 Area. And uh, we're looking at COVID infections. Of course, this is a, you know, co you know this is a, a geocoded map and the highest infections are in the, are in blue. And I would, I'm going to let you know that, at, that, that St. Louis is divided uh, by one street called Delma Boulevard. And north of this Delma Boulevard, the population is 95% African-American and south of this, of this boulevard, that the population is 80, 85% white. And guess where COVID-19 hit? This, my friends, is not accidental. Next slide. And, and, and it, it compelled a lot of my colleagues and I to really put some reports together. We're doing some, doing, still doing research on, on this and the more data coming out. We actually looked at the distribution of cases and we found that, and when we look at zip codes in St. Louis that held over 50% of Afri African Americans, although those zip codes constitute 16% of, of the St. Louis population, they accounted for 34% of the deaths. Uh, that was the disparity. Next slide. 
and, and, and this is, shows you even more graphically, uh, we're looking at uh, an actual uh, a evaluation of COVID cases per zip codes and uh, the bubble represents the size of these zip codes. We're looking at whether the you know, percent African-American on the uh, x-axis and the confirmed COVID cases on the y-axis. And there are two communities that we looked at. Uh, the red circle shows you an African-American community that's in North St. Louis, which is 95% black. And the green on the bottom shows you a, a population which is similar size, uh, but, uh, seven, but only 17% African-American. And they're separated by three miles. Yet the COVID cases were 10 times higher in that population in the north, the veal, the red circle, than they were in the green circle. This is what we're talking about. This is the, you know, we're, and we talk about structural racism and the, and, and the accoutrements of long-standing segregation. This is what we're talking about. Next slide. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to wrap up real soon here. I think I have about four minutes because I really need to, I want to hear from you. I know questions are coming in. And so uh, I have some concerns because now we're saying how are we going to get out of this? We're going to have a COVID vaccine in preparation. Here's a problem that we're having in this country. Uh, that COVID vaccine is not going to be well embraced by the African-American community. Read the headlines, folks. You can see one uh, saying, um, uh, uh, we're not going to be researched on. Uh, we're not going to, going to be researched on um, uh, uh, COVID vaccines. Trials have a problem. Minority groups don't trust them. Uh, this is the issue. Where is the root of that distrust? We certainly get that some communities have not been able to reach their full health potential, and what happens? Their dreams are deferred. They're angry, and, and they're not going to respond, and they're going to take a vaccine. And we know that that's only going to perpetuate this crisis. And we know who's dying disproportionately from this crisis. Therein lies the dilemma, the American dilemma. Next slide. So I wrote an essay uh, that, that uh, 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 afterwards, and I'm uh, further trying to, 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 to convince all of us that these COVID-19 disparities and criminal justice uh, brutality were interlinked. And they were interlinked based on you know, the sense that they are really uh, 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 are, are reflective of our greater dilemma, uh, uh, and we cannot overcome that until we declare publicly that racism is a public health crisis, and then we have to act on that. Next slide. So here's what I've tried to convince you of. Managing diversity is, a, is, is not just something that we can do to make ourselves look good, you know, um, to have a few people of color and saying, we got this, we've done this. No, this is a social issue and it's a moral issue. Yes, it's a performance issue and it's also a quality issue, but focus on the first two. It's a social issue and it's a moral issue. Next slide. A skip, next slide. Uh, skip, next slide. Uh, so, so here's what we have to do. We have to have discussions on our campus. Uh, uh, about the next steps to really ameliorating this, uh, moving forward as institutions. Uh, here is me with you know the former chancellor, uh, 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 Mark Bryden, uh, and some and other colleagues, and uh, bringing on uh, uh, NPR journalist Maria Hinojosa to really talk about next steps as an institution. We don't want to talk about this. We want to be able to engage ourselves actively with the community as equal partners to actually operationalize our, our concept of social justice so that every individual could reach their, their full health potential. Next slide. Uh, and and uh, so the next slide, we'll skip all these things. Next slide. Skip, skip. Next slide. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll go back, go back, thank you. So, uh, so uh, in order to really move this, it requires a lot of action. Uh, and a lot of resources. And the one thing that we did, we actually decided to create two organizations. First, I worked with some colleagues to create a, a health commission, which really uh, had a, a, as its uh, prime motive uh, an approach to improve healthcare access for those who are marginalized and disenfranchised. We then created an Institute for Public Health to really bring our best thinkers to talk about these issues in the same manner that I'm talking to you about. We know the science. How do we apply the science? 
how do we implement the science to make sure that the community is indeed improving? It was really important that we do both of those efforts if we're really sincere about moving the needle. Next slide. So you've seen this before, and I'm, I'm concluding now, uh, and I will get to your questions. You've seen this before, and we will look at you know, the social determinants. We clearly know that our, that our life expectancy uh, is due to a, a number of issues, right? Our health behaviors, our clinical care, uh, socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic factors, physical environment, uh, but we know that clinical care constitutes 10 to 20% of our overall health that most of our health is really driven by these other determinants. Uh, uh, and you can see them listed here. And I'm sure many of you have seen this slide or something like that. We then have to start addressing our efforts around health behaviors, around social and economic factors, and around the built environment. If we truly are, are trying to create an environment where people aren't feeling that their dreams are, are, are fulfilled. Next slide. Let me, give an, uh, so let me give an example. I think this is the last uh, two slides. Let me give an example of what I mean by this. Uh, so, so, so we can be really well-intentioned uh, when we talk about diversity and inclusion. We can be well-intentioned when we talk about actually community uplift. But if we're not thinking about those upstream factors and not thinking deeply about how to operate, operationalize those factors in collaboration with the community, with community, with people as equal partners. If we don't think about this, then we can do sometimes either more harm or no good. Now, I, I know this audience is perhaps aware of the Moving to Opportunity uh, project, which was a 10-year research demonstration that combined tenant-based uh, rental assistance uh, for low-income families to move them from areas of low income to areas of higher income. That makes sense, right? Give people housing vouchers, allow them to move out of unsafe neighborhoods, allow them to move out of low poverty neighborhoods. Who would disagree with that? Move into opportunity, right? You want everyone to reach their full health potential. Move them out of an opportunity. What was the problem with the Moving for Opportunity program? Next slide. Here was the problem. It improved the mental health for females, but not for males. Now, now I put in this, you now there's a graphic here of five black boys walking in the streets in some unknown neighborhood. Now, first of all, you're gonna ask, so what? You know, what does that have to do? Well, what, first of all, why are they walking in the streets? Well, they're walking in the streets because I grew up in neighborhoods like that, that looked like that. We walked in the streets because we had no idea who was gonna grab us if we walked on the sidewalks. Therefore, we had access to run quickly. I mean, that's the reality of growing up in the inner city. But there are five black boys who together, you see the co social cohesion. They need each other. They have that social support. And when you cleave them from each other, then you lose that social support. And then irrespective of what neighborhood they're in, they're alone and they're isolated uh, and, and they're alienated and, they're become, and, they're, and, and they, they become othered. This is what happens when you don't look, when you don't structure these, these large programs with this type of social racial lens. You can end up doing sometimes more harm. Next slide. So let me conclude uh, with uh, this quote from Dr. King. He said, the time has come for an all out war against poverty. Now, an all out war against poverty, what we're we talking about? We're talking about something like uh, General George Marshall, who, 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 who moved the United States to invest $12 billion in the reconstruction of post-war uh, Europe after World War II. That's what we're talking about. We can do that. Ultimately, a great nation is a compassionate nation. No individual nation can be great if it doesn't have concern for the least of these. Next slide. Barack Obama said the same thing when he received his, Oslo no, uh, his Nobel Prize in Oslo in 2009. It's essentially the same, the same statement. A just peace includes not only civil and political rights, it must encompass economic security and opportunity. For true peace is not just freedom from fear, but freedom from want, the absence of hope. Hear that term, people? The absence of hope can rot society from within. And when you lose hope, and then when you're down and out, then what do you do when you're down and out and you, and, and, and you, 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 you have dreams that are unfulfilled? You explode. Next slide. 
What have I tried to uh, convey? First, I've tried to state that cultural diversity within the, the, any workforce should not only be a 21st century moral imperative, but a centerpiece in our efforts to eliminate health disparities. You must connect the two. Diversity and inclusion is a process. It is not an outcome. The outcome is equity. Remember that. Diversity and inclusion should be a key element of quality of our institution and should be incorporated in all that we do, policymaking, administration, research, practice, and service. But the most important piece is the last bullet point. Diversity should be leveraged to address a complex issue that transcends all our differences, and that is improving health equity. Remember, diversity is a process, folks. It is not an outcome. Improving health, out, health equity is an outcome. When we do this, you cannot do this unless you have a moral lens. And when you put that moral lens and you can speak in that moral language, then you can appeal to the better angels in all of us. And then that is what it takes to get us through this current civil unrest. But we have to elevate our language and we have to speak about morality. We have to speak about the benefits of having access for all because it's not, it won't, it, this is not a zero sum game means that everyone has the ability to reach their full health potential. I know you embrace that. I know we're going to take this, this, this discussion and, and just really go out and do great good. Thank you for allowing me to share this. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Um, and from Gallery View, we give you our jazz hands here. I'll read out some of the questions here from the group. Um, and one of the questions is, a, I think, a very common question. Um, r related to these sorts of topics, which is sort of operationalizing it. So this is from Stacy. You know, how can health systems move past talking and difficult conversations and about about structural relationships? She says we're tired of talking. How can health systems make concrete changes? And I would uh, just sharpen that even more by saying, specifically with regard to equity, because we all look at our numbers and we can see, you know, our hyper hypertension outcomes our A1C outcomes, we can see our perinatal mortality outcomes, and we see, as you noted, the disparity. How do we, how do we make, take steps to enact that moral stance you're asking us to do and say, this is how we're going to change as an organization with, with respect to the care we provide? Uh, that, that was a, uh, uh, th thanks for the question, Neftali. Uh, that was a report uh, published by the RAND Corporation in 1995. And the report, no, I'll, I'll just summarize, it stated that health is best delivered and health and healthcare is best delivered in the community, by the community. And so we can't do this in our enclaves in academia or in the hospitals. We have to do this as equal community partners. And so when I'm talking to Washington University about let's operationalize this construct of health equity, I'm saying that we can't, we're going to have to just leave this, this community. We have to go to one of those zip codes I just showed you, the 63115 that had that high COVID uh, uh, rate. We have to go there and say, let's talk about neighborhood revitalization. Let's create, Washington University create a, 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 a redevelopment office. And we're going to actually work with you to leverage resources and HUD funding and uh, HUD grants and really do what we can to really revitalize this neighborhood. Let's use the CARES Act funding and other funding to really build up uh, uh, small businesses. That's how you keep people healthy. You stabilize their communities. And we could do a better, all of us collectively could do a better job of moving out of the cathedrals and more into the community. And if we can't always do that, make sure let's bring the community into our environment. Let's make sure we're asking the people in the community, what do you think? Help us. We sometimes go out there with this sense that we're going to go and help the community. We need to, we need to uh, have a greater sense of humility. We need to be helped by the community. That's how we begin to do that. And if I could editorialize a little bit, Dr. Ross, it sounds like you're saying that organizationally, each delivery system down to the clinic level should be more contextualized in the community in order to shape its uh, delivery services, which, which really would radically, radically change the business operations of a lot of our clinics, if, if we all really did that in each community. 
So, so I mentioned the creation of two organizations at Washington University I was involved in. The first one was the Regional Health Commission to oversee, you know, the integration of all our federal qualified health centers. That's driven by a, by a community advisory board. Okay, they're making the decisions. And I mentioned the Institute for Public Health. We have a community advisory board for that. They're making the decisions. So, so we know that, you know, uh, that we're closer to what is the right answer, Naftali, by having that type of community input. Uh, many of us are aware of this whole concept of, uh, of, of collective impact, you know, which is a concept that was pub uh, popularized uh, in the Stanford Review, uh, 2006, seven, I can't remember the, the time. Uh, well, whatever, then that's not relevant. Uh, so I think it's important that we really understand this whole issue of, of collective impact, which really is just the undergirding of that is collective efficacy, you know, convincing all of us that together we can come up with the right answers. That's what happens when you get into the community. Excellent. Uh, Kelly has a question here as well that I think is also a very common question. You alluded to this uh, in your presentation to a degree. Her question is, what are your thoughts about organizations asking, adding these DEI positions? I think those are diversity um, leader positions and working to recruit a diverse staff in response to this. Uh, not sufficient, sufficient, a step, what? Yeah, it, 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 it is, it is, it is a necessary, it, it's sufficient. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. I mean, so we have to do this in response to all of this. We, we have to have a diverse, diverse workforce. We have to bring people in, but sometimes we, we, that's such a hard thing to do anyway, that we will finally reach one point where we have uh, three, uh, 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 Latina females instead of non, we say, yay, we succeeded, we're done, okay, let's go home. Uh, and, and then we forget to ask, what, why were we trying to do this anyway? What was the purpose? That's that latter question that it, that really, that getting us into that, you know, that introspective phase is what we need to do when we talk about diversity and inclusion. What are we trying to change with diversity and inclusion? And when we can state that emphatically, it's important that we have this population here because that's going to allow us to move our research in this era. That's going to allow us to move our, our clinical enterprise and address these health issues in this era. We need to make sure that those things are linked and we've uncoupled those to a degree. And as a consequence, we've made ourselves vulnerable to assault by those who don't embrace diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, and and, and this, is, this is serious. And, and, uh, and I have, I've gone to Capitol Hill and talked about this. You know, this is so serious that we, we have to talk about the purpose, the end goal. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have ourselves, you know, I don't, I don't be too negative here, but I am worried that, that all the gains that we've made could become, could unravel in a short period of time with one Supreme Court ruling. So it's important that we really talk about the larger issues. Yeah, I, I uh, made a comment on that in the chat. I love that question. I think that's my take home for today, which is the idea of what are you asking diversity to do? And we've been talking at our conference about dangerous questions or wicked questions that we ask in complexity science. Um, and I think that's actually a dangerous question because if you actually ask, are asking diversity to do what it's intended to do, that should change you or larger, that should change your organization. And uh, sort of it's the idea if you put chocolate in milk, it turns brown, right? Did you want that chocolate to turn brown or did you just want to add it as a, some sort of side product, right? So uh, that idea that when you hire for minority candidates that you are also then inviting individuals who are going to change your organization, yes. I think is, is what we're trying to get at in part at least with diversity too often, I think the concern behind the question that uh, uh, the questioner asked, too often it's just having diversity in order to, you know, sort of meet the quota, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to ask a follow up there, which is, especially in your personal experience, um, how, how should organizations align themselves so that when they do hire folks from minority backgrounds that they invite that change into their organization? Yeah, so yeah, I, I know my family is from uh, we went from Memphis to uh, California, and the standing joke in California is that 
Okay, I'm a, and I can joke about Californians, okay? So uh, um, how many Californians does it take to screw in a light bulb? Well, you first have to ask a light bulb if it wants to change, right? Well, that's what you're saying. Uh, uh, do they want to change? Uh, and, and we have to recognize, we have to rely on behavioral theory to recognize that, you know, when we look at stages of change, there are some, I mean, some organizations are still in this pre-contemplative state. They're not thinking about change and nothing we're going to do. They may agree to diversity, increase in diversification um, because they're trying to keep the pressure off, but they're not willing to change. You have to ask, are they willing to change? Uh, that's what you're saying. That comes from actually having a review of, of the cultural climate at that institution. And, and sometimes that's the best thing to do, to actually do a cultural survey. And there are groups that do this. They'll come into your organization and they will assess your cultural climate and know where are you in terms of institutional readiness for change? Have you moved from pre-contemplative to contemplative to maintenance to action? You know that, so you have to get a sense. If you don't know, then you can force something in and you create, you bring something and nothing happens and people get frustrated and they leave and they scream bloody murder and you get and things actually re re regress. And so you, you have to prepare your institution for change. And that's hard to do because the institution is, is primarily uh, an institution that's been socialized to assume that things are fine. So, so that, that, that's not easy. But that's what we ask diversity to do, to do the complex issues, Neftali, right? You know, you, you want to bring in people who know how to do that, who have the, you know, the chutzpah to stand up and state this has to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. And actually, I'm going to ask one of our co-chairs to unmute Natalie so she can ask uh, her question. She had a really interesting comment around just the roles of kind of along lines. You talked about sometimes when you do good, you actually end up making things worse. So Natalie, uh, pose your question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the question uh, was um, related to your comment about um, community revitalization and asking the university to sponsor or spearhead um, uh, that economic um, uh, change process. Um, and my, my question was that often when we see that happening, and it has happened, um, that it leads to gentrification. And um, so wondering how you would address uh, guarding against uh, displacement as a result of that uh, well-intentioned, perhaps well-intentioned effort. So, so Natalie, you're entirely right. Uh, and you, you, you have just validated what I've said about the true nature of diversity and inclusion. It is inclusive of all the stakeholders. And if you don't have the community stakeholders there, then you're right. The end product will be, you know, just, you know, absolutely, you know, you, you'll have gentrification. Let me give, give you an example uh, of what we did here. And so there was, a, in St. Louis, there was another community that's to the south of the medical centers. It's called the Forest Park Southeast Neighborhood. Back in the 90s, during the, you know, the, the peak crack, crack epidemic, there were gang murders and, you know, it was just horrific. And uh, we said that in the same manner that we're talking here, we said that we have to do something. We have to be uh, 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 agents of change. So we went into the community. We said, how can we assist you in changing this neighborhood? And we had lots of conversations. And we end up bringing in you know, organizations that knew how to do mixed income housing. We leveraged that, received a $4 million HUD grant to create uh, mixed income housing in this neighborhood, displacing no one. And so now when you look at this neighborhood, the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood is now called the Grove District, G-R-O-V-E District. If you go in there and see what's going on, you'll say, oh my goodness, it is, it is, uh, it is exactly what you would want to see, Natalie. You know, you, it, it is diverse is socioeconomically diverse. I mean, it is racially and ethnically diverse and nobody was displaced. You know why? Because we were driven by the community, not by something that we thought we could do. That's the, that's the, 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 the distinction. When you bring in the community, they have to be activated, they have to be listened to. And uh, you've given a great description of what a good ally looks like, right? Instead of yes. a good savior, right? Absolutely, yeah. Right. Uh, you know, there's uh, a great comment and question from uh, Hillary on the chat that I want you to address. And mostly I just want to voice this. I don't know if you have a perfect answer for this, but uh, she's at an institution that receives federal funding. And as we all know, 
um, some of those organizations have been banned from actually doing uh, diversity training. So her question was, any thoughts on how to continue boosting efforts around equity in the context where that executive order uh, uh, takes effect? So, so, so this is what I was alluding to earlier, uh, when we will be under assault because we've not done a great job of really expressing the intent of diversity and inclusion. The intent of diversity and inclusion is not to uh, uh, lambast people into a certain ideological way of thinking. That's not the intent. And those who engage in that should really reflect on what they're doing. Uh, the intent of diversity and inclusion is to build a better inclusive society to advance, you know, uh, uh, equ uh, equity so that everyone reaches their full health potential. And as a consequence, you have this business case where people are more engaged, they're more productive, we have greater growth. Those are the benefits of diversity. That's why we're doing this. It, it holds true whether we're talking about business or law or any other, uh, in, in any uh, um, area. That's a benefit. Here's what happened. We have not articulated that well, and that's why we're under assault. And so, so uh, here, you know, uh, at, at institutions I know, we're actually awaiting a call. We want to be called. We want to be confronted because we want to have this argument. We want to say, okay, fine. You want to come here and say that we're we're doing this? Come, please come up, walk in the door. We welcome you because we want to have this conversation. At, with, at, with, with national policy leaders, with administrators. Britt, come on in. Absolutely. Uh, and actually, uh, folks are hoping you have that conversation because uh, you've already been nominated as uh, someone who should be an advisor to the next president. So uh, <laughs> uh, that, that should, should know that you've got some votes there. <laughs> um, now, this is a very kind of... Uh, of the moment type question that, that uh, Cynthia uh, proposed. Uh, something to think about. Uh, her, her, her statement was, I'm wondering if our rush to telehealth is creating further disparities. Why not focus on good infection control, for example, appropriate PPE, rather than ju just offering virtual sessions and provide the proximity needed during this crisis? So the context of that, of course, is so many of our underserved communities um, haven't had access to uh, video telehealth in particular. Sometimes in some, for example, we have some folks working at homeless clinics, don't even have access to telephonic support. And uh, we have been noticing the disparity sort of widening uh, between the, the populations that we serve. Um, and so just wondering about your thoughts about that function of the current pandemic and its impact on on underserved populations? Well, I mean, uh, th that's a mixed message. I mean, there are some good and there are some not so good in telehealth in, in this setting, in the COVID crisis. Uh, the not so good is that you, as you just stated, there's a digital divide. I mean, individuals, uh, I mean, I, I'm a nephrologist, I, I see patients and I, you know, most of my patients can't uh, do Zoom or, 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 or um, doximity, you know, and I have to call them, you know, and even that's difficult. And so that's, that's true. And they're alienated and you, you lose that social con uh, contact. That is true. But on the other hand, there are some individuals who, as we know, have been greater, more likely to be exposed to COVID because they're working in, in essential jobs and, and uh, they can't get away and, and they can't uh, break away and they, they don't have childcare and transportation. And you can make it easier for them to get uh, health services uh, that way. So no, it's no six, you know, a half dozen. I mean, there are some good, not so good. We need to work on the things that work and try to, you know, uh, minimize the things that, are doing, that we're doing poorly with telehealth. I'm not willing to throw out telehealth. I think there's some potential to do good. Absolutely. Uh, Rufus uh, gives us a really important question that many of us have also been working at um, in our clinics. Uh, so Rufus, uh, I'm going to invite you to actually unmute and ask your question about developing the workforce and developing it from the community, because this is a key issue here around when we develop, uh, when, when folks basically are in underserved communities, and then we try to hire them, but then they may leave our institution. So Rufus, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so um, just the, the higher the educational attainment, the more likely one is to leave the community in which one was raised. 
Um, even more so of coming from a low socioeconomic background. I know my doc program, the um, two black men that were going through it with me, um, you know, they went, they went elsewhere for work uh, necessarily. So um, in a doc program, because your, your school is not going to hire you and you went through their program. But I just find it an extremely delicate topic to address. And this is actually, I would say, globally true. You know, if you went to the Philippines and someone, the, the more educated they become, the more likely they are to leave that community in which they were raised, particularly if it's low socioeconomic. So I'm not looking, you know, necessarily for a, you know, a, a straight up, um, you know, jewel of an answer right here, but just what to do uh, to address that because you've got the, the educated person and family uh, and all the pressure on them, the love for their community and in uh, the delicate dance that's probably gone on as they've moved up education, all those factors just what, what to do to address um, that area in terms of community development. So we go in, but then, you know, um, folks, are, folks are leaving, um, you, know, you know, as we try to, to help and mentor and, and hire um, and get folks educated um, and, and taking next steps. Uh, the, the pipeline is leaky, isn't it, Rufus? Um, uh, and, and the pipeline will, will leak when you have uh, more pressure on that individual coming in. Uh, that pressure is that the individual uh, doesn't find social support, uh, hasn't had the proper, uh, hasn't had success in finding a mentor, uh, feels taxed as a, as a per person of color to do more than usual, uh, and has uh, maybe even has a, a sense, a sense, maybe some, some sense of feeling imposter syndrome. Those are the things that weigh on people of color when they enter into uh, uh, predominantly white institutions. I know, I know, I've been there, done that, uh, and so, uh, so the, the 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 key then, Rufus, is is to, is to create that type of support system, uh, and, and that's why um, I, I I talked about you, you, you know is the institution ready to change? You have to understand what is a cultural institution. When you bring someone in, I mean, uh, who's going to really support? That, who's there to support that person? Uh, will, will that person? Will we understand that that person's perspective on? On uh, 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 on uh, why uh, uh, something which could be a, a perceived as a microaggression to them is meaningless to somebody else. So this takes time to build that level of institutional support. But at least we should be aware of it, Rufus. We, we, we should be aware, and, and we should state that. You know, I understand. I mean, that's the greatest thing we can say to someone of color in a in an institution. And, and, and say it like you mean it, Rufus. Man, yeah. I understand what's going. On. I understand how you feel. I really get it. Uh, and and let let's try to work through that. Uh, that may sound trite, uh, but that is conveying a sense of empathy, and that goes a long way into making that person feel less isolated. To say that you truly understand how they feel, you're not going to uh, fix these environments right away. But you have to you have to have them have have a sense that you Rufus Wolford you're an ally, uh, and 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 that allyship is going to help marshal that person through those difficult uh, times in that in that institution. That's that's it's a complex issue. I can't give you a great example, great answer, but allyship is really you know the way to getting people through through these systems. Thanks, Rufus. And I I you know the been a lot of reaction here on the chat related to that. Uh, I can say personally as a Latino male that what you just said uh, strikes home. They're, you know, growing up in, in New York City to working class parents, um, uh, going to the emergency room for my health care, uh, and then being the first person to, to be uh, graduate college and then to have a doctorate, um, you know, naming that reality that there is this intense drive within individuals like myself and others who come from these backgrounds to, to uh, uh, succeed, that once you get there, you do feel like you have this imposter syndrome. You feel like, I don't belong here. This is a yeah. white world that is not the world I grew up in. And uh, it, it, it is hard to navigate. And yet there's this drive to get out of the neighborhood, to do better to do better than your parents did and to, 
make things uh, happen. And, and that, that is a real tension. And I think your call for allies to uh, be aware of that and to be willing to hear that part of the story and to name that part of the story is really important to creating an organization that is in fact inclusive, that recognizes that part of the journey and that part of the story. So I, I appreciate and many of the folks on the chat really appreciate you naming that portion of the dynamic with regard to why, why a lot of times it is hard to go back to the neighborhood that you came from and work there. Well, we are actually just a little bit um, over time. Now, one of the things I, I will allow people to check out here, we have our think and drink time here. You can go to other sessions and hang out with other folks there. If you wanna hang out a little bit longer here with me and have your think and drink time here, that is totally fine. Dr. Ross, you are under no compulsion to stick around with us. You are always welcome, of course. But I want the audience to give, express their gratitude uh, to you, as many have already uh, in the chat. So let's do another jazz hand before we uh, say goodbye to Dr. Ross. We really appreciate you. We appreciate the perspective you've brought um, and the gravitas that you've brought to our conversation. It fits so perfectly in the stream of what we've already been talking about throughout this conference. So thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure. I wish you all the best. Thank you. And know that you are always welcome at a CFHA conference. <laughs> I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a nice day now. For the rest of you, uh, thank you so much. I know it's Friday night. I'll be hanging out here as long as you want to hang out. Relax time. We can talk about the plenary. We can just talk about random stuff if you, if you feel like talking about random stuff. Um, but thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I will say that one of the things that is probably the most um, uh, sort of impactful parts about these conversations is um, the fact that as, as white allies, uh, you really have a lot of power. You have actually a lot of power to uh, create environments, uh, to notice things around you, um, and I hope that that feels empowering to you. I hope these conversations don't feel like they fall flat, like, oh, okay, there's just uh, more stuff that we need to work on. But actually, yeah, there's more stuff we need to work on. There's some actually things we can do in our backyards, in my homes and in my communities and in my clinics to do that. So I, I'm interested in hearing from you guys what you're hearing from all this and, um, you know, if you want to just unmute yourself or you can actually ask in the chat, we've got still about a hundred or so folks. If you could just ask in the chat to unmute and go ahead and unmute, that way we don't have multiple people unmuting at the same time. I just love to hear directly from you what you've been getting from this. What's, what's kind of not just today, but throughout the conference, what you've been absorbing. I'm curious to hear if it feels empowering or if it feels deflating. So let me know in the chat if you are interested in unmuting. And Jess, uh, Jeff also asked, I'll just say he asked, uh, can we access the chat, this chat in the recording? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the chats and the recordings will be, will live on CFHA Learns, on the CFHA Learn site. So once that's up, Jeff, um, chats and, and stuff so you can see the links and things that people have posted. Kent is raising his hand. Oh, sorry. I'm not seeing everybody on the screen, I guess. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hey, thanks so much. So I think I want to just share a few thoughts. Um, the first is sort of the latter. So you said, do we feel empowered? Do we feel intimidated, overwhelmed? I think it's really deep, intense stuff. I was just thinking to myself as we were wrapping up, can't we just like maybe have a session on like, you know, what's better Advil or Tylenol, you know, something just like light and simple. And, and it's not because there's no interest. It's just, if you really dig in, it's heavy stuff and it's, it's very profound stuff. So I'm very grateful for all of, all of that, um, really the theme for the conference and all these plenaries. And, and I don't think it's intimidating. I think it's, uh, welcoming. I think it's comforting. It's insightful. It's reassuring. 
Um, so, so I, I, you know, I'm kind of still hungry for more, so I'm very glad. Um, then to your earlier question, I think what's hard is that for people who are just becoming woke, so to speak, um, I think they're fearful, especially, you know, whites, they're, they're fearful to speak up because they don't know what they don't know. They know they're going to step in landmines. They know they're going to reveal their blind spots. And I think, you know, they feel very self-protective about that. At the same time, what I was taught in grad school uh, you know, as a white man is you are the ones with the power. It's kind of what you said, Neftali, you are the ones with the power. So it's, if it's someone who really does need to wake up, dig in, dive in, be active, lean in, don't be passive, it's you. So I, I really, that was the first time I had heard anything like that is when I was in grad school and I've really appreciated that kind of a, a nudge. Yeah, thanks for that, Kent. And, and you know, I think, I think that's part of what I hope we're fostering here is a conversation where people are okay stepping on some landmines because you can't have these conversations otherwise, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's tough. And even some of the language is tough um, to, to know whether I'm using the right words or not. Um, so I, I, I hope that that's something you take as a little bit of courage just to say, yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know all the right words and I don't know all the right things to say. Um, and if I make a mistake about it, I hope someone corrects me and, and I can learn and grow from that. Otherwise, I just stick with it in myself. And you know, Jake, um, I'd like you to unmute for a moment uh, just to expand on your comment because it goes to that idea. Um, there is a lot of shame that happens uh, in the midst of these conversations, especially as healthcare providers, I think, because we, we hold ourselves to a higher standard of, of supposedly providing, you know, equitable patient care and, and hopefully, you know, with uh, a lens of cultural humility. Um, but that standard sometimes can keep us from actually being you know, sort of honest with ourselves. So can you expand a little bit about, you know, your comment on shame? Yeah, I actually feel my heart racing, even just like starting to talk about this. And I don't want to turn this into my own like group therapy session or something. Um, I actually feel very much at home though at CFHA, like I'm among family members. Um, but it's, maybe I should anchor my comments a little bit in my own identity. So I grew up in a very evangelical Christian home where the stories I was told connect back to the Mayflower, like William Bradford and John Adams are part of your heritage. Other side, I have immigrants from Poland about two generations back. So there's this identity stuff that comes up, but my parents raised me with the story of like, people, if you don't work, you don't eat. People, like you gotta earn it. Like if you don't have it, it's cause you haven't worked hard enough. And so that was just normal for me. And I think as I've come into these conversations around um, equity and um, especially health equity, I am feeling that like, it's not like it's just starting. It's been going on definitely since graduate school, but um, there's a defensiveness I feel and a sadness for my family. And it's really alive right now because I'm trying to talk to people that I love, people I love deeply who are also Trump supporters who I have to hold that tension of like, mom and dad, I love you. I mean, they taught me about the person of Jesus and this idea of like, to be a Christian is to live just like Jesus, like strive to be like Jesus. And so like abortion is a big issue. And I'm trying to now talk to them about how we have to move past that and see like the character of Jesus in our leaders and like demand that. So it's, um, it very much feels like when I get into these issues, like there's a exhaustion and defensiveness that I have for my family, but also a desire for them to grow. And so I feel like a lot of times I'm an ambassador to that white culture that, um, that needs to change. And so I often am listening to these conversations with the ears of like, how do I translate this in a way that helps them see equity as a form of living like Christ in society that like, Christ as someone who would deal with pre-existing conditions <laughs> like directly rather than deny them. Um, it's, those are some of the tensions. So I find these conversations to come with a degree of emotional fatigue that then I get ashamed of experiencing because I'm like, 
why is this so emotionally difficult? But all of these things are part of the problem and also part of how things need to change. So uh, my head just feels like swimming and spinning after these conversations. But I really love that CFHA can create a place like me, like this, for me to come in and grow and participate. So sorry, that's a lot, Nep. And you know how I roll sometimes. <laughs> I see connections that don't exist, but I just, I love this group and I really appreciate conversations like this to help me connect some of these dots from a macro scale to the, the micro scale where I live and work. And just to put a plug for Madison next year, you guys, this has been like the most beautiful weather week in Madison that we've had all year. If we get this next year, it is gonna be like paradise on the other side of COVID. So I really hope I get to see each one of you next year. Of course, you just jinxed it. It'll probably snow, but yeah. no, thank you. Thank you, Jake, for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, that, that's part of what we bring to all these conversations, right? We bring our, our histories. And I think what's beautiful about this moment is it's pushing us beyond that exhaustion to say, yep, I'm, I'm exhausted, but, and it's worth it. It's worth it to have these conversations. It's worth it to face these things, even if it means conflict with my parents, which I can very much resonate uh, with. Now I'm wondering, I'm wondering as well what you guys, um, what you guys think about. We're having this conversation here, and I, I hope we've we have succeeded in creating a, a safe place, at least a relatively safe place to have these conversations. Do you all feel safe having these conversations in your institutions? Can you, can you talk about um, institutional racism in your own four walls? Is that, are those safe places or is that actually pretty difficult to do? I think, um... We can at ours. I know um, my uh, behavioral health division manager is on the call. Who, in uh, in a meeting uh, with staff, uh, definitely definitely brought it up. And I think it was a welcome thing to to be brought up. I know, um, you know, as as the white male, it's not easy to wear the face of the oppressor. Um, historically speaking, uh, at the same time, I can't get caught up on that, and you know, go. You know, hide in a corner somewhere in shame. That doesn't help anybody. And if you give your seat up at the table, then who's there left talking? Um, you know, share and relate, understand. Um, people tend to be really gracious when when you talk with them about it. I understand some of that is uh, perhaps still speaking from a point of privilege, but just find people tend to be pretty gracious and, and ready to talk and have the conversation. Thanks, Rufus. It's great that you have some space in your organization to do that. Are there folks in organizations that don't don't feel like they have that space or don't know? Because I, I think that's the part that's often hard. It's like you, you actually don't even know if there's space to talk about it at your institution, right? You're just kind of like tentative about the whole thing. I wanted to speak if I could. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm just so grateful to Dr. Ross and CFHA um, for their innovation and dialogue. I um, wanted, I think in my institution, I, my eyes are opening to um, not just my institution, but the spaces I'm in that the lack of safety um, in those spaces and in the last you know, number of months, something that I've been working to be more honest with myself is around you know the ideas of allyship or using my privilege you know what that means and if i'm really consistently doing that and i think you know thinking about that this is not a black problem um, as dr ross talked about this is you know our problem and not something you know moving from myself from a place of empathy to a place of um uh I don't know, connection with that as our society, you know, in that shift. And um, I have been, I'm a, a faculty member, and I'd say if you, this might be too generalization, but I'm going to put it out there. If you are 
a white faculty member and are not having the conversations with your students of color, you're missing opportunities or you might be missing something. Um, just because you're not having the conversation doesn't mean that the feelings um, and that the inequities are not there. And so that acknowledgement and that willingness to leave space unopened um, is important. I think that's, you know, to changing and being able to sit with that discomfort because we have a I have privilege as a white person to come in and out of it and I want to be in it um, and I want to be uh, conveying that to you know my students um, and I think this is how we change those you know structural things I've had students telling me that they don't know if they you know if they're safe and so being able to I think validate that and to um, meet them in that space so thank you for listening and thank you for the dialogue yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think there were a lot of nods as you were talking. Um, you know, as as a, a Latino male, um, I I made that part of my supervision uh, and training of every student that I ask proactively about um, their their background. And I I mean even even folks from white backgrounds, because one of the things that I think is, is missed out is, and this is one of the things I remember one of my grad school classmates from the island of Trinidad and Tobago, she'd remind us almost every, every chance she got. She said, you know, white people have culture too. And, and so this idea that only like colored people have culture and bring that to the white norm is part of the issue, right? And so, uh, uh, highlighting what that means, what the history is, what, what the feelings are, what the training environment thus feels like is I think part of good uh, training. It's part of molding uh, trainees who do bring with them to every patient encounter. And hopefully in my mind, I'm always thinking about them as future leaders, leaders of organizations, um, a cultural humility that allows them to create institutions that naturally have spaces for inclusion, that don't have to add them on at the end as some sort of tack on process, but that naturally include the idea that we all have culture, that we all bring culture to every encounter that we, that we come from, and that there is no normative culture. That is, there's only the us here in the room. There's the us that we uh, come together in a workspace or in a care team, et cetera. Um, and in having that just as part of standard training and curriculum, to me, um, just always makes a lot of sense. Now, that makes more sense for a person uh, of color uh, only insofar as you are born into it, right? I mean, I was born in New York City in, uh, uh, you know, Queens, New York, in as a Latino male in a Jewish neighborhood going to church in Far Rockaway, Queens, which was a Central American neighborhood, and then moved out to the Midwest to uh, the west side of Chicago, uh, suburbs of Chicago, I should say, and then found myself in sort of suburban Midwest America. And honestly, it wasn't until that experience that I realized, I remember distinctly when I, went, when I just went to grad school and looked around and I realized this is what white people are. I, I say, these are the people on TV. Like that, that's what I, that was my first encounter in grad school with, with that experience. Why? Because I was born into not, I was born into the other, right? I was born into not being the white normative experience. Uh, and, and that's the only reason why I had to deal with that. But the truth is that uh, that's the, the water that we all naturally swim in. So pointing it out to trainees is to me an essential part of their development, right? So having these conversations uh, with your trainees is super, super duper important. Sorry for that, that tangent. That's a scenario that I'm very passionate about. Uh, Let's see, I'm just checking out the chat here. There's some really great comments. You guys are, are doing a great job being engaged. Uh, Cynthia, you've, you've been super 
uh, chatty on the chat and have made such, some great points here. Um, I want to give you an opportunity because your fingers must be tired from all the typing. Can we let your mouth do some of that here? Can you tell us a little bit about your experience here? I, I did say other things, but I want to say I, I had that same experience when I moved to Chicago for grad school. I was 24 and I had never seen so many white people. Um, and I had that same thought like, oh, this is what's on TV. You're like the family. Uh, so it is a unique experience and I, it makes me laugh. Um, one thing I, so I have a background in running these difficult conversations. And one thing I will say is, so safety is a privilege. Uh, it is never guaranteed for people of color. So that want to have your comfort addressed immediately is a privilege and it should not be prioritized. <laughs> so that's one thing I would say uh, when you're worried about your safety. Now I know we have jobs and health insurance that can be lost and those are very real safety threats. But I want to remind everyone that those are safety threats that people of color live with daily. Uh, whether we're having these conversations or not. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> and another thing, I want to validate that it is normal to get tongue tied and want to just keep your mouth closed uh, when you hear all this information. And I like to think that that might be a wise instinct of our body. Uh, maybe if you're a person in power, the first thing should not be to talk unless it's saying, no, stop, this is wrong. Uh, but maybe education and uh, being aware of the other ways you can use your power outside of your voice, maybe that's what should be happening in the beginning stages of all of this. Uh, because voices can be equally, if not more harmful, even if they're well-intended. Uh, so one thing I would say, if you're in that stage, and unfortunately, it's not a stage, it's a status, it comes and goes. Um, so when you're in that place where you're, you don't trust your mouth, and there's minds everywhere, and you're seeing them for the first time, because you've been walking them on them. <laughs> it's not like they just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, so one thing I would say is be aware of the subtle ways you can give power to others without needing to use your voice very much. Uh, so if you're in a place where not enough people of color are talking, just being mindful that talking is powerful and not talking can do a lot too if there's someone who maybe can use their voice in that moment and you know they want to or they haven't had the chance to, so at least try. Uh, so I would say the power of silence the power of giving space, inviting people to meetings uh, who are from the community and are in your institution. Uh, a lot of times when we do come back and we serve our own communities, we're not put in positions of power. So we get positions where we don't get to really make a big impact, but we get to say we're here and they get to count our bodies. Uh, so one thing I would say, if you are in one of those leadership positions, just inviting them to the Zoom meeting right? Having someone else there that is systematically not invited. Uh, that's not requiring much language and it could go a long way and it could give people the opportunity to use their voice if they want to. Um, so those are things, just a couple of examples. Uh, I wanted to offer those very actionable things that you could do uh, now without having to learn words. <laughs> so th that's one thing I would offer. That's awesome, Cynthia. Thank you so much. That's why I love CFHA, right? You have these gems all over the place. Um, there was something I was going to say about that, um, and it escaped me. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so it's just the, you know, I think, I think actually this is one of the really beautiful things about this time um, that this is the Black Lives Matter has, has not been a movement perhaps even dominated by black people, but actually all of the new faces coming into the scene to say, no, this is an us issue, right? And taking some of that lead. Um, it's just important to understand that, that people of color don't 
are not experts at this, you know, only in so far as uh, if you're Hispanic, you've grown up in a, as a Hispanic, and if you're African American, you've grown up in this, and it's not necessarily true that every Hispanic or African American wants to be um, uh, the civil rights leader. Um, you 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 want to just be able to inhabit the space that you're in professionally, organizationally, in your community, in, in a way that um, uh, is is equitable, and that gives you space to breathe and to be who you are and to bring your whole self into that space. Um, and so it's just important to understand. And that the flip side of that should also be comforting to you, in that it's not as if people of color know all the right words to say either or know all the right things to say or the right ways to broach cultural conversations. Um, we, you know, people of color may have more experience with that just simply because they notice that in their day-to-day -day life, but it doesn't make them experts for all that. And so uh, you don't A, want to put, you know, minorities in that position just because they're minorities. Um, and you also don't want to put yourself in a lesser than position just because you're not a minority and feel like you don't have the expertise to, to do it. Um, it really just takes a little bit of courage to step out and say, uh, I may not be an expert, but I care about learning and growing and figuring who I am and getting to know my teammates. Um, that's a lot of times all you really need, just a little bit of cover, uh, courage around that. Deepu, I'm going to bring you into the conversation because you have said so many wise things to say uh, at times. Do you have some words for us today? Uh, I mean, there are lots of things swimming through my head um, with all of this stuff. And I think um, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Ross's focus on equity and being able to have that as a focus and really shift the conversation from equality. And I think that's something that I think everybody's been picking up and not sure how to do. Um, and then also the powerful question of what do you actually want, I mean, diversity or even equity to do? Do you want the milk turned to chocolate like, uh, like you were saying? I do want to connect with a um, few folks and maybe all of us around this issue of not knowing what to say and not knowing what to do. Um, you know, in family systems, we say if you feel confused and sort of lost in your visit with the family, well, that's probably how the family is feeling too, right? So it's a reflection of the system that you're experiencing in the moment, and that should ought to sort of guide you in what to do next. So if you're kind of lost at words and we're sort of feeling a sense of emotion or like what Jake said about the, the raising heartbeat, et cetera, well, that is the emotion or the sentiment of the moment and probably the uh, probably where the nation is now as a whole and um, to a great extent, maybe greater extent than uh, earlier this year. And it it is probably also important for us to realize that there is a minority of people that have been at that space for a long time. Like people are now sort of catching up to uh, the space, right? And the, uh, I think Jeff Ring, who is here, uh, did an amazing facilitation for us in our podcast where we were asked to really reflect on um, various different things, but also to not forget that we come to the table with gifts and that there are gifts that we offer up at any moment. And, and the gift doesn't have to be um, you know, well-articulated critical race theory and how that's going to dismantle and disembowel whatever's happening in front of you, right? Because that happens in academic papers and great presentations and talks and maybe even well-written movie dialogues, right? Like in movie screens and stuff. But in the, um, the humdrum of everyday life, we sort of have to do what Jake did today. Uh, we, and I think he set uh, such a good example to um, how to respond to that moment and, and just sort of being open and honest about that issue. 
that's sort of where I am with that. And I'll pick up, uh, thank you for that, Deepu. I'll pick up on what you said earlier about, um, you know, not knowing what to do with the equity issue. Because I'm, I'm passionate about taking the conversation to action, right? And I, I think that one actionable thing that every organization ought to be doing right now, just on a systemic level, is um, asking the question, the, the equity question around disparities about all the things that they track. We track all sorts of things in primary care, but do we ever ask why? What's behind the disparity that we see again with our care? And then I think what Dr. Ross, and I think what I'm learning more and more, because I, I don't have any answers. I'm sorry if my voice sounds authoritative, it just always sounds that way, but it's not because I have answers. Um, but one thing that I'm learning more uh, uh, that connects with Dr. Dr. Ross said is, I think it's going to be more and more incumbent on our institutions. And I know this is hard. It's not easy because we have a lot of work. We have a lot of stuff that we got going on. But if we're going to solve those problems in our communities, we do have to ask the communities what they think about how to solve that problem. Because that's the missing link. We're sitting there trying to think about how we uh, improve our hypertension um, uh, control rates and how we control, how we improve our A1Cs. And we're sitting in a room thinking about, you know, what intervention is going to, what are we going to do? Or for those of us in integrated care, we're thinking about how we can integrate BHCs into the care process, et cetera. That's all good stuff. But I think we have to come face to face with the, that data that Dr. Ross showed, which is we have tried lots of things over decades to get those lines to cross and they're not crossing. And, and I, think, I think asking the community is really the, the step one of beginning to, to develop solutions that are contextualized in that, in that community uh, uh, for us to, to begin to make that, that, uh, that difference, essentially. I'm wondering if you all are, are hearing that as well. And if that's, that feels actionable to you to go back to your, your institutions and say, are we doing this? There are some small steps that we can take, um, even in, in the reporting that we uh, pull from the EHR to know how we're doing. So one thing that I uh, piloted some time back were, was some reports around um, how equitable, equitable we were delivering services in our behavioral health program after over multiple clinics. So actually as a part of the, um, the measurement for each clinician, um, I, I could, uh, uh, we had them assigned to a population of three to 5,000 people. And so we could see who was in that population because we had all the ethnic and racial and you know, men and women, all those, all those criteria that we took on a regular basis. So I could take that group that was assigned to each behavioral health clinician we could see what their uh, impanelment looked like, and we could see what their penetration was across that impanelment. And, and where I got stuck was in this process, I was like, this is, this, this is the first thing that I can do. Um, but I, when I was sitting with my behavioral health clinicians, they're like, what do you want me to do with this, Julie? I was like, well, I guess just raise awareness. This was years ago, it's like three or four years ago now. Raise awareness of it. But what clicked in my mind with um, what Dr. Ross was saying well, this is what you do with it. The, you look at your commu the communities that you're in panel to, that you're responsible for, who you're serving, who you're not serving, what, why? That was as far as I got. Why? Why am I, why am I only seeing white people between the ages of 25 and 35 as a behavioral health clinician in a primary care clinic that serves all ages and all ethnicities? Um, so why? And then if you have a group that you are leaving out or is not coming to you for some reason, uh, we know from a hiring perspective what we need to do. We also know that what communities we need to outreach to, and we know who we may need to hire as community health uh, uh, community health workers to outreach to these communities that are in our responsibility, but at the behavioral health level. And this is the thing that's like fully in my control, fully in our control, like what we're doing. 
and what I can have reporting on, I can be fully in control of figuring out who we're leaving out and why. So that was just like, a, I was so glad for that uh, connecting of the, the community advisory groups that are in all FQHCs. Now, whether they actually represent the community is a really important question to, to ask. But they're there. So there are resources, there are things that we can do. So I was just inspired and empowered by the whole process that we do have tools that are actually not that hard to operationalize that could make a real big difference here just by having awareness of it and putting those operations you know, into place. No, I, I agree because I remember uh, Dr. Kamara Jones when she spoke in SDFM a few uh, years ago. One of the things that she mentioned was, you know, she went through a thing, it's called the Montefiore Residency Program in, in somewhere in New York, I guess, where they uh, have a huge focus on social medicine. And she said prescribing an antihypertensive and organizing outside of the state capital were both equally relevant medical interventions. Uh, for hypertension, right? So whether they were organizing for housing and all of those things. When I was in uh, in my training, we one of the things about this community advisory boards, Julie, that I was beginning to think about, one is making sure it's re representative. I think PCMH has a requirement that you have a community advisory board and uh, that you actually meet with them regularly and engage them. I think the other step that's often missing is does the community advisory board have any decision-making power? Because I remember in the training institution that I went, the community advisory board switched every few months. So there was no constancy. And then they were brought in and they would get a tour of the clinic and the new services, et cetera. So it was a lot of information giving rather than service designing uh, or like designing the actual services. So I think uh, advisory boards with some um, impetus for or space for decision making from them too, which you know, which can be an interesting systemic relationship to build with. This is Patty Robinson. Yeah, Patty, go ahead. Sorry, I I haven't been looking at the raised hand. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. I was just gonna step in to kind of reinforce what the woman said just before Deku. That's a really important measure and something that many people probably listening right now could obtain. And um, it's so powerful to, to see that as a BHC. And that's one of the measures that um, I've been working for about almost three years in New Zealand. And that's a country that really cares a lot about health equity. So that was a measure that we had uh, in our initial pilot of primary care behavioral health and then in our national demonstration uh, project which included you know north island south island um, rural urban suburban uh, kopapa maori clinics so clinics that are led or that are run by maori um, as well as just all kinds of clinics and um, the model as we um, delivered it in all of these diverse sites was associated with health equity, meaning that Maori and Pacific Islanders accessed behavioral health care at the same rates as Europeans, and that their outcomes, and we use things like the Duke Health Profile, so health-related quality of life, were equally as good as Europeans. So about 71% of Maori improving, no, 74% compared with 71% of their overall sample. So, I mean, and that just, that's not it. You haven't arrived, obviously, because our biggest push right now is um, real health equity beyond that measure is a broader concept. And so we're, we're studying, you know, the model um, with uh, and asking for input um, from uh, cultural 
leaders as to as, um, the health and the safety of the services we're delivering, make them better. Great, I love those uh, real actionable examples of things. Again, I'll apologize. I was not looking at the raised hands and things. I was expecting people to actually post in the chat. So Andrea, I think you had your hand up before for a while and I totally spaced on it. So I'm so sorry. You okay. have the floor. To whoever advocated for me, I, I think that's what must have happened. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I was just going to make, it's been kind of like a cumulative reflection is um, you know, I heard Jake share, um, and then as we talk about, like, what were some organizational changes we can make? Um, and I think one thing that I think is really important to highlight is that even though, um, and I really hope I don't get kicked out for saying this, um, even though as an organization, I think, I think we've made so much improvement this year, and we've, you know, sort of tried to meet the moment. Um, I, I'm, I feel cautious around appearing as if as if CFHA has it all together, and as, as if CFHA has figured out how, what it means to be an organization that focuses on race equity, um, what it means to foster that kind of um, th those kind of values in its in its membership, um, and I think when we if 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 we don't if we're not careful about that, we risk modeling what it looks like as a large organization, um, what it means to look look. Um, look deeply at what membership of color feel actually whether they do feel actually safe in the organization um, how what other membership feel like they are aren't getting and the process that we go through together to address that and then improve so that we are actually um, moving towards an organization that does focus and center race equity and not just performing because it's like the topic of the moment if that makes sense so Again, I'm balancing both an, an appreciation for all the wonderful plenaries that we've had and this space to, to discuss this, but also, you know, I hope, I hope there's also some solace in that CFHA doesn't have it together either. Um, and hopefully um, in making that transparent, we can also model what it looks like for other smaller organizations to get there. Well said, Andrea. Uh yeah, I think the point is the goal shouldn't be to look like you have it together. Like that's not the point. Um, living out a um, living out an inclusive experience doesn't look clean and and perfect. Um, it, it actually is very messy. And this, I actually go back uh, quite a bit to my own roots growing up in New York City. Probably, yeah, not probably, statistically the most diverse place in the world. Um, in fact, Queens, that got hit the hardest by COVID, is the most diverse uh, set of zip codes in the world. And uh, it, Queens is a messy place. I mean, it's really messy in, in lots of different ways. Uh, signage, um, the look and feel of the city is actually, it's this so much history there, it just got cobbled together. There was, doesn't look like some planning commission came together and said, this is how we're gonna plan this neighborhood to look like. And this is how it's gonna be. And the cultures that exist there also, um, uh, in the, the intermixing of the cultures is, is super messy. I grew up, uh, well, one of the neighborhoods that I grew up in, I told you about was uh, a Jewish neighborhood. The other neighborhood I grew up in uh, started out as an Italian neighborhood and then uh, Southeast Asian and Indian uh, families uh, took over that uh, neighborhood, Queens Village, if you're interested, where my parents uh, uh, just moved from, actually. And the intermixing of all that created a lot of messy cultural everything. Um, but that, that, to me, taught me that, um, you know, inclusivity is a journey. It's not a destination. You're always working towards figuring out relationships. You're always working about figuring out how to live together and to live with one another and to better each other's lives, to raise each other's kids in the same space um, in a way that, that meets every family's needs. And so, yeah, it would be a sad thing if we somehow hold ourselves up and say, yeah, we've, we, we did it. 
what do we what do we do? I, mean, I think that's what Dr. Ross was saying. <laughs> you know, it's like diversity is not a, an end, right? I mean, it's what what do you want diversity to do? And I think we we want to ask that as a membership. What do we want diversity to do? Well, we definitely want number one. He said on this, we want it. We want to live our values out through the diversity that we inhabit. Um, and just like we've talked about on the individual level, we're going to make mistakes. On our organizational level, we're going to make mistakes. That's fine. That that's part of it. That that's just the way it's going to be. That's all right. As with most things, if you're not making mistakes, you're probably not doing the right thing. If I can just say something to that, Neftali, I think one thing, and I don't know, Andrea, if this is what you're thinking as well, but if this is, because this conference felt like, okay, y'all, this is CFHA. <laughs> like, that's how I felt throughout the whole conference. Uh, with the decision of the uh, the speakers and the values that are being talked about. Um, and so if that's like the coming out, right? Like, okay, we are a social justice organization, a conference. Um, then this is the beginning of the process as well, not just the content. So when those mistakes happen, this is the beginning of how the board and how the organization as a whole will involve all of the members in that accountability process. And I don't know, Andrea, if that is also what you're thinking, because that is where the wait and see is right now for, for people of color in this organization who have probably experienced those mistakes. Today, or this conference, one of the mistakes was bringing up these issues without a little prep uh, so what very often happens in conferences when social justice comes up is then why people feel things <laughs> and then they go to their sessions with those feelings and then they go to their discussion groups with those feelings and then we have to do what Monique or M Monica talked about of having our reactions and putting them in a certain way so that we can be for, and that's okay. I am happy to do that, right? I'm happy to, but that prep would be helpful. Uh, the, the White Privilege Conference infamously went through this problem uh, where people of color went to the conference. I went to that particular conference and there was never a heads up, you know, just, just so you all know, we have gotten feedback from members and we know that this may result with this load, this white work. Just a heads up, everyone. <laughs> that's all we could have had, right? And so that's, it's a small mistake. And I honestly, it's not a big deal when the process continues in a way that's anti-oppressive, right? So me being able to talk about it here in this space is already anti-oppressive. Uh, so Andrea, I don't know if that's what you were thinking uh, but at my head is there. So this is day one. What's day two? What's the mistake going to look like? What's the transparency going to look like? Uh, my ears are open and I think Andrea's are too. Um, so that's one thing I would say. I think if we were following debate rules, which I don't know very well <laughs> because of the way our leaders model debates. I don't know how a debate's supposed to go, but I think Andrea has the ability to say something because I was talking about her point. <laughs> now, I think, I think you touched on a, a lot of really important points, Cynthia, and I think that's what, that's what I'm getting at. Um, again, like, and I, I don't, I don't want to act like I am coming in here and I haven't felt like CFHA is receptive to some, I've, I've, I've talked to like people before about this and I have felt like there's been some like recept that there has been a lot of receptiveness actually. Um, but I'm also very aware that just this time last year, I was feeling very uncomfortable in CFHA as an organization. And I'm very mindful of if I had, if I didn't know what was going if I didn't know a little bit of what was going on in the background and this year all of a sudden there's all these plenaries about social justice, there's all these sessions about social justice 
I would feel like, where the heck did this come from? Is it authentic? Um, and is it gonna last? So I think be because like, I do very much see this as my organizational home, that's what I don't want to happen for membership. Um, and so that, that's, why, that's why I bring this up. Yeah, and it, you know, um, this is where it's a developmental process. Um, so actually all these plenary experiences stay for the first plenary experience on Wednesday were actually planned uh, by January of this year. So in large part, what you're seeing is not a reaction actually to what occurred around the time of the George Floyd murder, uh, but actually the pre-planning around that. Some of that was birthed around the planning committee, just making complex patient care and health equity the centerpiece theme of the conference. So that was, that should have been telegraphed because that, that was the, that was a statement that we have had created around the conference before that, that was actually created, that, that statement was created this time last year, because that's when we do that prep for the next year's conference. Um, and then Andrea actually uh, spoke with a board member about some of her thoughts uh, related to this. And then that helped spur also some of the um, additional focus on issues of race and culture. Um, and then of course, what occurred with the, this spring, summer uh, nationally just heightened it essentially is what it did. And so the, the first plenary experience came of that, uh, uh, that developed uh, out of that uh, piece. So I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, always a, it's always a tricky thing to know how to engage membership in the, in the process part of it so that they're tracking with us. Um, but I think, I think this is a good start. This last year cycle is a good start to a, what is a, a committed, enduring conversation um, because this isn't about a conference on social justice. That doesn't do anything. Um, this is about Im embedding it and, and the board had a conversation in July reaffirming that this is not a new thing for us. This, this is really about living out our existing values. And yeah, we probably haven't done that very well. So let's do it. Let's start. Let's figure something out. Let's make some mistakes around that. Um, and our job together as a community is to hold each other accountable to that and to figure out how to bring each other along because we're not a monolithic community. We're, we're not all in the same place with regard to these issues. Even if uh, the organization leans left, that doesn't mean we're all in the same sp space with regard to where we are with all these issues. So, yeah. Well, it is 625 on Friday. Unless someone has some burning, someone want to have the last word? I hate having the last word. Someone with a little courage. Since I feel like I kind of got us into like a hole. Yeah, me. <laughs> um, I guess I, I just want to say like, um, I hope that doesn't come off as like not valuing the work that CFHA has done. I do think we're going in such a powerful direction. I've seen it like in the engagement and all the sessions that we have, the plenaries, like I think members are ready for that type of content. And even just like the space for, for us to voice all of this, like the, the journey that we went on in this past hour, um, I think is really important. So I, I am very grateful for that. And I'm feeling very grateful 